On the special episode of Movie Geeks United, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Dress to Kill with director and film historian Sam Irvin. Mr. Irvin is a prolific filmmaker in his own right, and he was an assistant to the film's director, Brian De Palma, on the set of Dress to Kill as it was being shot, and is kind enough to join us to share his memories of working on this iconic film. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to our show. We had you on two years ago for our retrospective on The Fury, so I guess this is kind of a quasi-sequel, picking up where we left off the last time. (laughs) (laughs) Great. I'm glad to be back, Adam. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. You tell such great stories. (laughs) <laughs> well, should we um, refresh people's memories as to how I got involved with De Palma in the first place? Oh, absolutely. It was a great story. The uh, the story about uh, Phantom of the Paradise, is, uh, that's one for the book. Yeah. So if you want to reiterate that, I, I'm all game for that. So. <laughs> all right. We'll try to, I'll try to whiz through it this yeah. time. Um, so I, was going, I grew up in the Carolinas, actually Asheville, North Carolina, but I went to school at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. And I was going there, and I was a huge Brian De Palma fan. I had seen Sisters, which just blew me away. I was a big Hitchcock fan, so, you know, all of his Hitchcockian references and the Bernard Herrmann score and everything, just, just uh, it was just the movie that made me really want to pay attention to De Palma. And then he followed that up with Phantom of the Paradise, which just also blew me away, and I was just like this, you know, I wanted to become a super groupie. And so I decided uh, I was head of the the film committee on campus and we ran a movie theater and I decided we're going to do a Brian De Palma film festival and I'm going to see if I can get him to come. And so I called him up. I got a, a casting number out of Hollywood Reporter for a casting office when he was casting Carrie. He and George Lucas were reading Every Kid in Town for Star Wars and Carrie and a joint casting session, probably the most famous casting session in the history of movies. And they put him on the phone. (laughs) Like I couldn't believe it. So I asked Brian if he would come out, I explained what I was doing. And he said, uh, he, he, he was in Los Angeles at the time. He lived in New York. He said, listen, I need something at my apartment in New York and I'm broke. If you can give me the airfare to South Carolina, then to New York for the weekend, and then get me back to L.A., I'll come for the Triangle Airfare. And I said, done. So he came out, and I took him around to some film classes, and he drew storyboards on the chalkboards and explained how he prepped his movies. It was incredible. And then we showed some of his films, like Sisters and Hi, Mom and Greetings. And then Saturday night, we were going to do this midnight show of Phantom of the Paradise. We told everybody to come in costume, and Brian was going to judge the best one, and we had prizes. It was sold out. Everybody was just totally jazzed and psyched. And we gave the prizes. He picked the winner. And then we start the movie, and if you recall, it's the uh, Death Records logo is starts to slowly spin on the screen of the dead bird, and there was no sound. I freaked out. I ran up to the projection booth. The sound bulb for the optical soundtrack had burned out, and there was no spare, and it was Saturday night after midnight nothing was open and we had to cancel the screening and send everyone home and i thought all of the goodwill that i have built up to this moment with De Palma just got flushed down the toilet and um no because brian has a bit of a wicked sense of humor and he thought it was funny and so uh <laughs> he uh, he li- once I started working for him and everything. The following, um, I, I was the following summer. I was between my junior and senior year, and I knew he was doing the Fury. By then, Terry had come out and become this huge breakthrough hit of his. If I had gotten to work on Terry, I, I mean, that's still to this day my favorite of all the De Palma's films. I so regret that I didn't get to work on that, but. I called him up when I heard he was doing the Fury and said, listen, I'm on my summer break between my junior and senior year. Can I please come up to Chicago and work on the Fury? 
He said, yes, I worked as a production assistant, an extra, and I also got an assignment from Cine Fantastique magazine to do a whole journal on the making of the film, which gave me access to have one-on-one interviews with Kirk Douglas and John Cassavetes and Brian and everybody on that movie. And uh, and so Brian saw me as this, you know, not only this super fan groupie, but kind of a go-getter. And he... Um, got in touch with me just as I was about to graduate the following spring. He had been teaching a course at Sarah Lawrence College on screenwriting. They had written a script for home movies, which he wanted to make into a low-budget film that summer. And he called me up and said, hey, I know you're graduating. Do you want to come up and work on this movie? And I said, you bet I will. And I jumped on a plane right after my last exam, did not even bother to go to my graduation ceremony, And I went right up there and I expected I was going to be doing the same thing I did on the Fury, a production assistant, maybe an extra, whatever. And he told me, no, I'm going to have you be the associate producer and production manager. (laughs) So he basically threw me into the deep end to see if I could swim. And I guess I did an okay job because after that, he asked me to stay on with him full time as his um, assistant. And I worked with him on developing a whole bunch of projects, some of which never got off the ground, including Prince of the City. We worked on, he worked on that for a year and developing the script with uh, the great playwright, David Rabe. And he had gotten De Niro to agree to be in it. And, but De Niro had like three or four pictures lined up beforehand. So it was going to be a while till he was available and the studio didn't want to wait. And the next thing I knew and Brian knew, Brian walked in one morning to the office and, and said, have you seen this? And he throws down the New York Daily News and Liz Smith, the columnist, had written that Sidney Lumet had just been signed to direct uh, Prince of the City and, with Tariq Williams in the lead. And that's how Brian found out about it. And lo and behold, Brian's agent was Sue Mingers, a huge powerhouse agent, who also represented Sidney Lumet. So she had totally screwed him over. And he, the next call, you know, he said, get Sue Mengers on the phone. And he fired her that instant. And uh, it was really just a terrible situation. I couldn't believe um, that it happened to him. And um, one of the scenes that uh, that he was, you know, had, had very carefully sto- already storyboarded and was really excited about doing was when the lead, the lead character in Prince of the City wears a, a microphone under his clothes and goes in to try to, um, you know, record conversation with the bad guys. And the thing starts to burn his skin with it shorts out and it's it's like sparking and, and burning his skin. And he has to, he has to excuse himself from the meeting and run into a bathroom and rip this thing off before it, you know, totally singes through his stomach. And he, you know, Brian is sort of a revenge ended up using that whole sequence in blowout. Um, So it, it it didn't go, go, go entirely to waste. Um, but, as, but eventually, uh, he started developing Dress to Kill. And, uh, when he had the script done, this was about, it was 1979, um, early, I would say late spring, early summer, he had finished writing the script and he was starting to cast it and, um, one of my earliest memories of that was he had he gave me a copy of the script and said, I want you to take this to Jill Clayberg. Now, he had gone to school with Jill Clayberg. He knew her really well. She had been in uh, The Wedding Party, which was one of Brian's earliest films, about 1969, maybe, something like that. And it also had the young Robert De Niro, who who did some of, you know, some of De Niro's earliest films were with Brian and, um, and also William Finley, who was the Phantom of the Paradise. I mean, um, but at any rate, Brian had known Joe. And now in 1979, she had just um, 
been nominated for an Oscar for Unmarried Woman. It had come out in 78, but the Oscars, of course, you know, the nominations were announced in the beginning of 79. And, and she was like one of the hottest actresses going at that time. And he wanted her to play the role that it went to eventually went to Angie Dickinson, Kate Miller. And um, but he wanted he wanted Joe Clayberg. That was his first choice. And it was partly because he knew her, partly because she would be a big box office um attraction for the cast and you know would help them get the green light and get get the picture going because she was such a major star at that point and uh and like janet lee's early demise in psycho he wanted a big star that people wouldn't expect would would get bumped off you know early on in the film and so um he was really, really hoping that that was going to work out. And I took the script to her. Uh, she was at some I, some kind of like press party or something for, for something else. And I went in and, and uh, gave her the script. And she talked very highly of, of Brian and said she'd read it right away and get back to, to him. And uh, there was a photographer there and I, and I, said to the photographer, can you please take our picture? And so I actually have a picture of me with Joel Clayberg the day that I went there to give her the script. It's just totally crazy that I that I managed to pull that off, but I did. So then, you know, reported back to Brian and we waited and then she, of course, um, politely turned it down. I don't re- really remember the reasons, you know, I'm not even sure Brian told me or I'm not even sure she told him. Um, but you can imagine, you know, there were there was nudity requirements. It was pretty grisly. It wasn't a huge part. And here's this woman who's just, you know, at the peak of her career being Oscar nominated. She was getting, you know, offers right and left. So you can imagine that she's trying to be a little cheesier than normal and, and pick something that, you know, probably where she's more like the lead and has, a you know, more of a, a bigger arc of the character and that sort of thing. So I'm sure that was a big part of it. And um, so the next person Brian wanted was Liv Ullman, the great Swedish actress who had been in Ingmar Bergman movies and everything. And she happened to be in New York. She was in New York at that time in the summer of 79, starring on Broadway in I Remember Mama, a musical. And so Brian gave me a script and I sort of did, did a re- repeat of what I'd done with Jill. And I went to the theater and Brian, of course, in both cases told me, don't give it to an assistant or some lackey. I want you to be sure the script is handed directly to the person. And um, and he had, you know, prearranged it and through their agents or, you know, whatever that, that to expect me and all that kind of stuff. So when I went to the theater, I was um, taken to... Liv Ullman's dressing room and put the script right in her hands and she was very sweet and um you know said to tell Brian thank thank him for offering her this and she can't wait to read it and she'll get back to us and blah blah blah. Well of course she also said no. Um maybe for the same sorts of reason. Um and you know who knows. But ultimately of course the role went to Angie Dickinson, who totally nailed it. And it's hard for any of us who are fans of the film to imagine anyone else in that role. Um, but it is kind of fun to, you know, fantasize what, how different it would have been or, you know, if these other people had been in it. But anyway, that's how things were sort of going during pre-production. And um, and then, of course, Nancy Allen was cast. She was uh, seeing Brian at that point. I can't remember if they were married yet. Um, they, they actually married when Nancy was shooting 1941, because I remember her coming back to New York for a weekend so they could get married secret, you know, kind of a secret ceremony. And she left like on a Thursday night, I guess. And she wasn't scheduled to shoot on a Friday. And I guess didn't tell certain people or whatever, because all of a sudden on Friday we were, I got a call from Spielberg's office and Spielberg was on the phone and he said, where is, where is Nancy Allen? Where is Brian? You know, I, I, and, 
they suddenly had changed the schedule and needed her for shooting. And it was this big hoo, hoo-ha. And finally, I found Brian. And I said, you got to call Steven. And, and, I, and I didn't want to tell Steven that they were getting married because it was kind of this secret thing. And so Brian called him and fessed up as to what was going on. And, the, and Steven calmed down and everything was fine. And they're, they're all friends again. But it was it, for a moment there, it was it was uh, it was pretty testy. And um, but at any rate, on Dress to Kill, they were already very much a couple. And so she, you know, he wrote the part with her in mind and um, and then casting Michael Caine. I'm sure there were some other actors um, on the list, you know, major actors to play that role. And I but I honestly don't remember. Um, I don't recall who they may have offered it to before Michael, but, but Michael was, you know, absolutely brilliant. And, um, and then we also had Keith Gordon and I had on home movies, which I had just associated produced and production managed the summer before in the summer of 78. Um, Keith Gordon was the star of that with Nancy. So they knew each other very well. And we also uh, brought back, um, for a tiny, tiny part at the very end of Dress to Kill, we brought back Mary Davenport, who played the the mother in Home Movies, and um, and she is the woman in the final scene uh, where she's overhearing Nancy and Keith talking about um, the, the surgery for a transgender person and she's at the next table in the restaurant sort of looking over her shoulder like oh my god what are they talking about and that is mary davenport now for people who don't know mary davenport she happens to be the mother of jennifer salt who was in sisters as um one of the twins with margot kidder and jennifer salt and um and mary davenport's husband is waldo salt the great uh screenwriter who did scripts for I think he won the Oscar for Midnight Cowboy and he wrote Day of the Locust and was an amazing screenwriter and um so anyway it was just and I loved Mary Davenport she was such a sweetie and she also was in Sisters so um you know there was a lot of history and so this was these were all sort of family you know extended family members of Brian that at that point to have them come and do the film and uh, and even Bill Finley did the voice of Bobby, the um, you know the Michael Caine character, um, on on the sort of voicemails uh, that you hear on the telephone and stuff because they if they knew if it was Michael Caine's voice, you'd immediately figure out it was Michael Caine. So um, they wanted to make sure that that voice was was very much disguised. So they brought in Bill Finley to do it. So anyway, I've been blabbing on and on and on. I'm so excited to talk about this. But um, anyway, that those are the uh, those are the things I remember leading up to, you know, shooting and casting and that sort of thing. And, oh, and also uh, I'm forgetting um, Dennis Franz, of course. And um, Brian had gotten Dennis when we were in Chicago doing The Fury, and Dennis lived in Chicago was a, you know, just an up and coming actor. He had done like one other film, a small part in, in Robert Altman's a wedding, I believe if it wasn't that one, it was another Altman film. And, um, but he had come in to audition for Brian along with other local actors in Chicago and Brian just loved him. And once he started doing the part in the, in the fury as the, the, policeman who's just bought this new Cadillac that, of course, goes through this entire chase scene, uh, big, big car chase, and, and you keep thinking the Cadillac's going to get scratched or ruined, and of course it never does. It just keeps avoiding, 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 avoiding any kind of any kind of anything, and he's so terrified that it's going to get wrecked, and then of course at the very, very, very end of this sequence, it goes plummeting into the river. <laughs> but, um, but Brian loved Dennis Franz, and Dennis was such a kick to work with and so much fun. So he, um, you know, brought him back to play the policeman in, or the detective, I guess, in, um, in Dress to Kill. And, and you know, Dennis just got along so well with Nancy and everything that he ended up, you know, coming back and doing Blowout after that. So, 
you know, again, it was just a, it was a, it was a big family affair of, of fun people to work with. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, it, it is amazing how he, or, or it's interesting, I should say, how he does return to the same actors a lot and, and, and it works out, you know, they, they always manage to, to give what he, what he needs for each one of those films, even though they, the faces are familiar. They always seem to bring something different, and yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's you know it's. I guess um, you know I, I, he he when he realizes that he's found something good, he likes to <laughs> stick with it. And I know he uses a lot of the same technical collaborators as well, like the editor Paul Hirsch. I know has worked numerous times with him, and Jerry Greenberg uh, did as well. And some of the same cinematographers, yeah. Bill Most Zygmunt, of course, and uh, quite a few others. That uh, so, yeah, I, I, yeah. I noticed that's a recurring thing for him. It it, it is. And this, this film, um, it's funny you mentioned the DP and the editor. This film, it, it, it just was an odd situation because he wanted uh, Bill Most Zygmunt to shoot it and Vilmos was not available. Um, and so he ended up with, uh, with Ralph Boda, who had done Coal Miner's Daughter and some other great things. And he was a very capable and very good cinematographer, but it was the first time working with Brian. And so it took a bit for them to, you know, figure out a working style together. And, um, and I think that, you know, Brian really wanted... Um, Vilmos, who had, of course, done Obsession and had and would later do Blowout. And then the editor, Jerry Greenberg, who was fantastic editor, but Brian had been used to using Paul Hirsch. Well, of course, once Paul Hirsch had done Star Wars, he became, you know, one of the most sought after editors in the business. And so Brian was having to uh, to juggle, you know, schedules with everybody else and so paul just wasn't available on this particular film but i know that paul would would have you know was his first choice and uh but um so in that in that regard brian on dress to kill was working with a couple of you know major um components of the crew that were new to him and and as as i know as a director, you know, it does take some time to, for the learning curve and to kind of figure each other out and, and figure out the working relationship and everything. So that probably, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I'm sure that that was, you know, a little bit daunting and a little bit disappointing for Brian to have to, um, you know, go through that. But on the other hand, it introduced some, different colors and that maybe wouldn't have come if he had worked with the exact same people again. So, you know, who knows? It, it certainly, um, the movie speaks for itself and I think it's, it's such a great film and um, I don't think he suffered in any way by having, um, you know, these different people in those positions. Now the music of course uh, was Pino Dinaggio who Brian had used on Carrie and on home movies. I had gotten to meet Pino on home movies and um, he barely knew English. He had to have a, um, a, an interpreter with him when we brought him to New York to look at the cut of home movies and everything. But Brian has some, you know, Italian blood in him and he knew a little bit of Italian. And so they were able to communicate pretty easily. And, uh, and so he wanted him again. Now, Brian had originally discovered Pino because of Pino's score for Don't Look Now, the Nicholas Rogue film with Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland that was so incredible and such an amazing, amazing score. And so um, that's why Brian wanted Pino to do Carrie. In fact, um, I was told later that the some of the temp music that Brian and Paul Hirsch had put into Carrie when they were temp scoring it was was some of the cues from from Don't Look Now and uh and even that moment when the when the blood comes when the blood is dumped on Carrie that that big you know I don't know what you call it where all the strings just go like that there is there is one of those string moments on the score 
to don't look now and they they use that in the temp score so um and uh and i you know i was such a huge fan of pino that years later when i did my own film i directed my own film oblivion in 1993 i guess it was it was a sci-fi western with with julie newmar george decay and a whole bunch of people um I got Pino to do the score to that and and he, you know, did an amazing, amazing job. I just I love Pino's work so much. So um it was really fun to, you know, get to work with him a little bit when he would come into town to look at the the cut of the film and then he'd go back to Italy and write the score and record it there. Um but but definitely, you know, meeting him twice on home movies and on Dress to Kill, you know, getting solidified enough of a relationship where I could call him years later and beg him to do my own movie, which he was very graciously agreed to do. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing that their collaboration continues to this day because the last yeah. two films he's directed, Pino is, has scored both of those as well. So yeah, it, yeah. it continues on, and uh, hopefully we'll it, continue on to another film if uh, if that happens, and I hope that he gets another one out there because I think the last two films he's made have been compromised to some degree, uh, especially the last one. Uh, I'm not sure about Passion. It seems like that, that – I don't think there were too many compromises on that one, but I think this, this last film was not exactly what he had in, intended from what I've read, and, and so I hope he gets another shot at it to – without having to do the compromises that he had to do with this last one. So anyway, that's a whole other story, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but I know just... it's a, but you're, you're absolutely right. I hope he does too. He also has a brand new book that just came out. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's um, a, a new novel that I'm looking, I'm holding the book in my hand and it says a new novel from Brian De Palma and Susan Lehman. Huh? And it's called, are, and it's called Are Snakes Necessary? And then there's a little uh, endorsement blurb at the bottom of the front cover of the jacket from Martin Scorsese, who says, it's like having a new Brian De Palma picture. And it's got some very cool 50s pulp novel artwork on the front of this sexy woman holding a knife. And there's a big knife with a... Uh, reflection of a guy screaming in the night but uh and, you know it just it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun and um so i'm looking forward to reading that and it literally came out like like a week ago <laughs> wow so it's uh you got to check it out i got mine on amazon and uh and with all of our sequestration going on it's a good time to read a book oh yeah that's fantastic i i had no idea that's uh this has been quite a week we got the uh the woody allen uh, memoir and then we have yeah. uh, <laughs> and then we have this so that's a yeah. that's a nice double it's shot called, so it's, it's totally it's called our snake necessary okay and, uh, so look it up on amazon and and grab a copy i i, I can't wait to read it that's that's great. I'll I will definitely be getting a copy of that. That's yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I was gonna you know get some uh, maybe your take on some production stories when you were actually in the yeah. shooting process. If you have any specific memories of of that, and I'm sure you probably do. Well, of course, the the big feed, of course, is the uh, the the big elevator scene with Angie getting getting slashed and. That was um, that elevator and the hallway and everything. We built that as a set uh, in some warehouses on I, somewhere in the the West Twenty streets in New York. I don't remember the exact street, but um, I do remember things like the the building itself had, had asbestos in it, and so there was recommendations that people wear masks, which is so apropos to what we're going through right at this very moment. <laughs> and and I remember that most, you know, because asbestos back then had, had been determined to be cancer-causing with long-term exposure and that sort of thing. And so most people on the film didn't really didn't worry about it or do much about it. But I do remember there was a guy on the camera crew who was always wearing a mask. And he was probably the smart one, but uh, but 
you know, we weren't there that many days where I, saw, I didn't think the exposure would have been too terrible. And it was really just, it was, the asbestos had been used as insulation and there was kind of on the ceiling, you could see the asbestos had been sprayed and dried up on the ceiling. And what you, the concern was that if any flakes were in the air, um, flaking off of it, that you could, you know, breathe that or whatever. But I don't think it was really super dangerous, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, but um, at any rate, I just, I remember the the hallway, you know, behind each each door of the hallway was, you know, there was no, there were no rooms or anything. And we'd have to, when the, the, the uh, apartment that she came out of, we had to do a little tiny um, return wall, as they call them. So when she opened the door, you know, you wouldn't just be seeing nothing there. But, um, but the, and then the elevator itself had, you know, flyaway walls. So the cameras could be put anywhere it needed to be. And, uh, and if you recall, there's a, the, the hallway L's off to the side where there's a um, doorway to the, the um, fire stairs and there's a little window on the doorway and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so all that was, was part of the set that was, that was created and built. The, um, the, the lobby, you know, when you go down the elevator, there's a little girl and, and, um, when they get down to the lobby and and she has to go back up to get her wedding ring that she forgot and all this stuff. So um, the lobby was actually a, a real building and uh, it was down in the wall street area. And so we shot actually shot in the real lobby and we shot the elevator for real uh, in that place. So when the production designer designed the elevator, he based it on an actual elevator in that building so that it would match. And uh, so, you know, that, and of course those sequences were shot at different times. I don't recall which was shot first, um, but they knew ahead of time what the location was going to be. And the production designer, you know, based his set building on that, of course. And uh, when Angie, you know, was covered in blood and everything, when they finished uh, the shooting that sequence, I wanted, I just knew this is like, this is like the big Janet Lee moment. I wanted a picture with her. And they're like, you know, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want any pictures of Angie with blood on her because that'll give it away. And um, so I convinced the, you know, they're, the continuity person and the wardrobe people would take Polaroids of the wardrobe and for continuity purposes. And they were snapping these pictures and I jumped in there and I just said, quick, grab one. So I have a picture of me with Angie in the elevator um, with blood all over. And, and I had to keep it quiet. I didn't even tell Brian that I had it. And, uh, and, you know, I knew that I couldn't, you know, there was no social media back then, you know, where was I going to release it to, you know, to the world. And I just kept it to myself for years. But of course, when the movie came out, Brian was horrified that the the set of, you know, lobby card stills and, and stuff had at least two in the set of eight that showed Angie being, you know, stabbed in the elevator. <laughs> So there was absolutely, you know, there are total spoilers just, you know, with, in the marketing department um, giving that away. But, you know, that's typical. You, you, you try to keep things secret and then you see the trailer that the studio put together and it's spoiler central. So <laughs> anyway, it didn't it didn't turn out that it was a very well kept secret. Oh, wow. Yeah, that um, yeah, that that would definitely <laughs> I can see why that would that would not sit well with him because yeah that's the whole I mean if you can imagine when Psycho was was released if there had been <laughs> some sort of a photo of yeah. <laughs> Jenna Lee getting murdered in the shower so yeah yeah oh yeah and I think you know and obviously I think Hitchcock had a stronger you know stranglehold over the marketing of Psycho to make sure that that there was no breach of that but um, you know with Dress to Kill it was film ways and they were in the process they ended up being acquired by AIP or you know I don't know it was just 
it was kind of a mess. The, the whole distribution arm of it, everybody kept changing hands. And so I don't think, um, you know, there was as much of a concerted um, game plan that that was being followed, obviously. Um, we shot that last, the, the last scene in the movie when they're in the uh, restaurant with, with, the, with Mary Davenport at the next table overhearing Nancy Allen and Keith Gordon talking about transsexual surgery, um, that was shot at the Windows on the World restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center Tower and the Twin Towers. And, uh, and we had gone, jumped through hoops to get that location. And Brian was so excited to get it. It was relatively new and very glamorous to be able to shoot there um, back in those days. And it had been used for The Wiz, the Sidney Lumet movie, uh, uh, when they get to Oz, you know, the, the, the Twin Towers have been, and, and of course in King Kong, the Jessica Lang. But, you know, it was still, it was still, a, you know, not a lot of movies had gotten to use it and, and this restaurant especially, and the view was just incredible. Well, we get there after all, jumping through all these books, figuring out what day would it, they wouldn't have to, you know, uh, shut down too much of the business and, you know, it wouldn't cost an arm and a leg. I mean, it still cost an arm and a leg. But we get there and it's a totally overcast day with clouds everywhere. There was no view at all. <laughs> it was like, oh, my God. And so what are you going to do? Do you just say, well, we're not going to shoot and come back on another day when when the view is there? Nope. They're, you know, you, you got to stick to the schedule and there's too much money involved and just too many factors. And uh, so we went ahead and shot and we could have shot it, you know, on a soundstage with, you know, a white sheet out the windows for all, for all it mattered. Um, so that was that was a, a disappointing day for sure. But like anything else, the, the you know, it, it's all about the story and the characters and what's happening in the scene, not about the view. So, um, you know, it might have been nice, but it, it didn't kill the moment. No, definitely not. It's still it, it's still a nice um, uh, after all the other events in the film. It's kind of a nice little calm moment there that that still works. And so, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Before it ramps up again, of course, with the uh, the big finale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, um, so what I was going to say is also, you know, so locations like, let's say the world, you know, the Windows in the World restaurant said, hey, you know, Monday is our slowest day. That's the day you should come in. And they would have scheduled that on a Monday. Just I'm shooting from the hip. But mm-hmm. as, 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 I, I generally find that with restaurants when I'm trying to use them. They'll, they'll tell us, you know, oh, we're closed on Monday, so that's the day we go in. Um, and then, you know, you work your schedule around that. The other thing would be, um, let's say Angie Dickinson is coming in for this, you know, relatively small part. You're going to try to schedule her scenes as close together as possible so that she isn't um, spread out through the entire production. And uh, so I do recall that, you know, they tried to gang up her sequences and scenes as much as they could into a block of, of shooting time. She might have a day or two off here and there, but they didn't want her to have, you know, weeks off to come back and do, you know, one more scene or, or whatever. Sometimes you can't help it, and sometimes that has to happen, but you try not to. Um, so, yeah, the schedule of, of order of scenes is just kind of all over the place. and. And uh, as I was saying, even with that elevator sequence, you know, there's one, some of the scenes are shot in a real location downtown, and then these other scenes being shot in a set, and they could have been weeks apart for all I remember, you know. And um, so you have to have the continuity, you have to have the wardrobe, you have to have, you know, everything. You know, they everybody has to be doing their job to make sure, you know, there isn't a screw up with that kind of thing. Another thing we did was for the museum sequence, which was just incredible. I have a couple of things to talk about that. Um, First of all, there was a, um, we're, of course, talking right now in 2020, but last year in February of 2019, 
there was a screening of Dress to Kill at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood, and Nancy Allen was there for a Q&A, and I went, and it was a almost totally full house, and when the film showed, after, as soon as the museum sequence was done and that incredible Pino Donaggio cue comes to a climactic end, the entire audience applauded and loudly and it was one of the few times that i've been in a film where you know i where you felt that eruption of of just you know just this spontaneous thing where everybody was just enthralled at how great that was now granted a lot of people in the audience maybe everybody in the audience were fans of the movie and everything else but i mean that that sequence is incredible. And when people talk about how Brian's set pieces are operatic, that is the example that I use because the scene, you know, Angie has no dialogue through that entire sequence. And it's, it's just a masterpiece of the film montage work, the steady cam work, all of the bits and pieces of propping the glove and the this and the that and 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 then the editing pulling all of that incredible montage together which Brian very intricately storyboarded out I'll talk to I'll talk about his storyboarding in a moment um, pulling that all together and then Pino doing this incredible piece of music with it I mean it was just it's just a bravura piece of filmmaking and to hear everybody, you know, just so enthralled and applauding it was just incredibly satisfying to hear. And, um, and, it, and it deserves it. Um, the sequence itself, Brian wanted to shoot it at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but they would not allow a film crew in there under no circumstances, uh, or at least not the money that, <laughs> that they had at their disposal. And so, but they would let us shoot out front. So we did shoot the the front, the exterior scenes uh, when Angie comes out and gets into the cab and and all of that. And we see Bobby pick up the drop glove, which, you know, she tosses the glove aside and, and then we see Bobby pick up the glove. Um, so all of that was shot at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but everything you see inside was shot in Philadelphia at the museum there, uh, the big museum. I forget the exact name of it, but it's the one with the Rocky steps where he, you know, where Rocky runs up the steps, going to fly now. And there's a Sylvester Stallone big statue out front of the of the museum, none of which, of course, we showed. It was only the interior. But um, it was kind of fun to go to that location. And I remember going down there, um, we were right. We took a train from Penn Station, and I, Brian, you know, had a bunch of bags and shoulder bags and this and that, and I was kind of being the valet carrying all this stuff. And Nancy came with him, and even though she had no scenes in the museum, but she was there uh, with him for it and, and watched a lot of the shooting. And uh, but when we arrived at the, at, at the train station in Philadelphia. Brian just, he was so excited. He just like jumped off the train, not carrying anything. And I'm scrambling to get all the bags that I've got literally like 10 bags hanging off my shoulders and everything. And barely was getting off the train car as the doors were closing and they closed on a couple of the bags. And the train starts to pull away and it's dragging me with it. And I'm holding onto the strap for the bags. And oh my God, it was totally crazy and finally you know the train comes to a halt and they open the doors and I get out but I thought I was a goner and I thought if I if I let go of these couple of bags I'm going to be fired <laughs> so I, I remember that as quite a terrifying uh, moment the arrival in Philadelphia but um, but then in the museum itself we had you know everybody had to be very careful about not touching anything. There was a lot of restrictions about that. Um, you know, there all this priceless artwork everywhere. There were lots of guards and things keeping an eye on the crew. And um, But um, 
you know, back then, Steadicam was still a fairly new uh, piece of film equipment. And uh, it was really thrilling to watch, you know, that amount of work being done with Steadicam. So that was a really, really um, fun time to, to watch all of that in action. And uh, so that, you know, working, you know, just, just seeing that whole thing come together was, was incredible. Now, the way Brian storyboards his films at his office, at, uh, back then it was at 25 Fifth Avenue. It was an, a, an apartment that he had had until he started making better money. And then he bought a, a fabulous palatial um condominium or whatever at uh at one fifth avenue just down the street a couple blocks but uh he kept the old apartment and turned it into his office so i had one of the bedrooms was my office it was no longer a bedroom it had a lot of file cabinets and my desk and the other bedroom he had turned into his office with his desk and uh but in the living room he had put cork boards up on the walls all all around the living room. And on that cork board, he would tack up a uh, little, he got blank business card size cards. And on each of those cards, he would do little stick figure drawings uh, to storyboard out the sequences. And then he would, he would tack them up in vertical rows. So scene one, you'd start uh, you know, on the left side of the wall, and you'd have a strip of however many cards it would take for him to to illustrate the different shots in that sequence. And then the next row right next to it uh, would be scene two. And so some scenes would be very long, might even take two columns of, of cards. And uh, other short scenes would just be a, a handful of cards. And my, part of my job was to very carefully take the cards down, um, write code numbers on the back so I knew exactly, you know, okay, this is row one, card 17, and uh, and then zero, put lay them out on the Xerox machine so that I, we could Xerox the storyboards in order to hand out to uh, the crew members that needed to see it production designer, cinematographer, whatever. And then once I Xeroxed them, then I had to, you know, of course, pin them back up on the walls. And, uh, but, but the incredible thing of, you know, being involved in that is that I could really, really, you know, look at them in detail and, uh, and see the revisions that he would make or, um, you know, whatever. And, and if there was something that didn't make sense to me, very often the uh, crew members would come to me and say, Hey, what, I, I don't quite understand this, this shot here or whatever. I kind of had to know. So I would be constantly asking Brian, now, is, it, is this what you mean here? And he would say yes or no. And um, so it was, it was an incredible learning experience for me to be that involved in his headspace when he was prepping the film ahead of time. And of course, all this was done in pre-production as, as Hitchcock would have done as well um, of just planning out these sequences and uh, from a visual standpoint. And then sometimes before the location was even picked uh, and, and if, if picking the location required alterations or, Brian touring the location suddenly gave him, oh, my God, we could actually do this or we could get a camera over here and do an overhead shot or whatever. He would make adjustments and changes to the storyboards as we went along. And uh, so it was it was just inc incredible to watch him at work with that. And and it's certainly something that I took to heart as as a director myself and, and how I prep my films. I, I'm not Brian wasn't a great artist. <laughs> you know, they, these were very crude stick figures. Um, I don't, I, I actually adapted it in a different way. I, I shot list my films very much in detail. Um, I felt like some, there were sometimes it was very hard to understand some of the, some of these still frame drawings when the camera was going to be moving so much, you know, because there's no movement in a, in a, 
freeze frame. And so he would he would draw arrows to the direction, let's say, the, a steady cam shot or a dolly shot or a crane shot would be moving and stuff. And I I just found that since I'm not an artist and there were so many times when arrows were necessary and it was it had to it would have to be explained anyway to somebody else so they understand what you were talking about. I just do very detailed shot lists where I will write out. I'll just say, you know, the camera is going to start in a close up and the camera is going to move back and pan over to the other guy, you know, or whatever. And so I just write it out. But the principle of, you know, doing all of that in pre-production and having very specifically thought it out visually is something that I very much uh, took to heart from my studying Hitchcock in film school and seeing it in action with De Palma on these films. And um, so, you know, that is something that I use to this day for sure. Yeah, it's it's funny you you mentioned that because I had spoken with William Catt, uh, who starred in Carrie, of course, several years back, and he said something very similar. He had gone over to uh, De Palma's apartment in the pre-production phase of Carrie, and he said they were all up on cork boards, all of the the storyboarded sequences from the film, and he said he he was very well prepared before they ever shot one frame of the film. So yeah, that's that's. That's an interesting method to his, uh, his uh, working method that he had, and it, uh, it yeah it, it certainly comes through on the you know all the prep comes through in the end product that's for sure you can see it on the screen yeah it's for sure there's no question and and Brian would love you know when people I don't know that he did it with every actor but if he sensed that an actor was engaged in that kind of thing and it would help them. He would bring them, you know, he'd set up a meeting and have them come to the office so he could give them the, basically the tour of the movie, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this, is, this is how the scene is going to unfold. And uh, Nancy found it very fascinating, and she, you know, she would always be very involved, and he would he would tell her what he had in mind. And um, I don't recall if, if Angie came over, and she, she may very well have, um, and I may not have even been there, at the time, but uh, I don't recall that, and I don't recall him doing that with Michael Caine, although it could have happened with, when I wasn't there. But uh, Keith Gordon, who, of course, later became a director in his own right, he was fascinated to see all that kind of stuff. So he, you know, he was very much there, mm-hmm. and, and Brian was gleefully, t- you know, given the tour through all of the shots, and, um, you know, so it, it just depended, I think, on on the actor and how engaged they would be in wanting to know that kind of stuff. Right. Sure. That totally makes sense. Uh, were, were you involved at all in any of the shooting of the uh, famous shower sequence at the beginning that opens the film or <laughs> with the, uh... Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I was there. Uh, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, and, uh, Angie did full frontal nudity and some of the very wide head to toe shots. Interesting. All of the closer, tighter shots, and certainly all of the inserts where you don't see her face, um, those were a body double. Now, Brian interviewed a number of women <laughs> for, to find the body double, and um, I remember we his, he had his trailer out. And I think we were maybe at that warehouse studio when uh, where the elevator set was was constructed. I just remember his camper, you know, where his his dressing room trailer. And this was one of the days when you know several, maybe three or four or five women were sent over by the casting agent to interview with Brian for the body double and they would I would usher them in one at a time and Brian would interview them and and uh, I'm assuming they would have to disrobe and Brian would decide if they would be a a viable match. The girl that ended up getting it um, her uh well, I, I guess just say it. Her pubic hair was not the color that Brian wanted, 
and he wanted it to be blonder because this was Angie Dickinson by after all. And so I do remember that they had to ask her if she would bleach out her pubic hair for the, for the role. <laughs> but um, the interesting thing, and I'm sure Angie was very happy about this, is that these women, or the one, certainly the one that was chosen, was, you know, probably 22 or three years old, <laughs> much, much, much younger and more nubile than, than uh, Angie was at that time. And uh, so, you know, I mean, it's interesting, I, you know, there are times when I'm like, does, that, does this really match? <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a movie, you know, let's not, it's not a documentary. So, um, you know, Brian definitely uh, romanticized the, uh, the, those inserts quite a bit. And um, it was uh, the, uh, I, I don't, I don't remember the girl's name, but I know that she had appeared in Playboy, you know, and probably done a centerfold or some kind of spread and, you know, had done nudity before and they knew that she was going to be comfortable with that. Um, it's interesting that the one thing that I have taken with me to uh, when it comes to nudity in my own movies, um, you know, I just thought, gosh, that's that's a tricky situation to have somebody come and and actually disrobe, you know, for auditioning for that kind of thing. And of course, you know, this is back in the seventies there, nobody was thinking about the me too movement or anything like that. Um, uh, but you know, if something had happened where the girl said one thing and Brian said another thing, and so he said, she said, you know, it's just, I, I saw, I do remember thinking at the time that this, could have easily gotten ugly if if somebody wanted to make up some story or you know whatever and and I just thought you know I don't ever want to be in a position where um, where that something like that could end up happening and so when I uh, when I was doing a series called Dante's Cove we had a lot of um, full frontal male nudity and things like that in it and um I just made sure that when we were going to audition people, we did two things. I made sure that I had a female casting director in the room with me, and we told the person ahead of time that um, we do want to see what your body is like because that's what you're being hired for, especially in you know these the small roles where it was it was strictly you know someone to appear naked as an extra or whatever. Um, so what we're asking is when you come to, and we told them ahead of time, when you come to audition, bring a, a selfie photo, a current one of you naked. And then as, when you come in to audition, we'll talk to you, tell you what is expected and everything. And if we're, uh, if we're pretty sure that we want to hire you, then you can show us briefly the picture on your cell phone because you know we didn't have cell phones back in 79 but we did when uh when we were doing this in the in the 2000s and then we don't have possession of the photo we you know you, you so the person would just show it to me and the casting director for two seconds and then they would take the phone away and then that would be it and um and it, so you know it I, I felt like we came up with a system that was that, worked quite well and the people were much more comfortable and um you know and we never had any problems so but it was definitely thinking about that situation with stress to kill that that got me thinking you know i want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a compromising position of of you know having to deny that something happened in this audition setting that you know whatever but um but I, you know, that was that was an interesting situation, and you know, it all went fine, and there was no problems. But it did occur to me that there, you know, could have been a problem. One of the other big scenes was when he, when uh, Keith Gordon is outside the window, and it's raining that stormy, rainy night outside the uh, Michael Caine office, mm -hmm. and all of that rain had to be created with rain towers and everything else and we were 
shooting outside of a real brownstone for the exteriors in New York. And that was an incredibly, crazily difficult sequence to do. And if you recall, the rain is not just coming down a little bit. It is just pouring down rain. Yeah, just buckets. And poor Keith Gordon, you know, take after take after take and just soaking wet and just a total nightmare. And that was really crazy. And um, but it was something. I mean, they, you know, it it was all with these these giant, they, they call them rain towers, but they're just, you know, a, a pipe that goes way up in the air and then has a sprinkler on the top to spray it out. And they had probably at least a dozen of those. Um, and then, you know, hooked up to a fire hydrant and we had to have people there from the fire department working that. And we had, you know, it was it was a big, big deal. And uh, and between takes, you know, there'd be so much water everywhere that that would they'd have to come and sweep away water <laughs> that was collecting and where Keith Gordon had to stand by the window. And it was crazy. It was very crazy. And then. For the interior of Michael Caine's office, that was create that was built on the <clears throat> the set, the same building that um where we did the elevator set. And so for the interior, uh, when they have shots from the inside looking out the window, um, some of that you know we had to create rain in the studio itself, but they also we got inside the real apartment when we were on that street to set up a couple shots where when there'd be a big lightning flash and you'd see Keith Gordon looking into the window, but the camera would be inside the window looking out. They wanted to have the depth to see that there was a street behind him and all of that. So there was a couple of close-up shots of him at, through the window where the camera was just taken inside a real apartment, inside a real window and looking out. So it was, again, a, you know, piecing together the real location and the set to uh, to make it all sell, but it was one location. Oh, they did a very convincing job. You you can you could not tell unless you know. That's for sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's pretty seamless. It's very seamless. Yeah. And then one of the other interesting things is that Brian was very worried that if you recognized – uh, Michael Caine in drag, then the whole the whole who done it aspect of the film is just completely ruined. Mm-hmm. And so he did not want Michael Caine to play Bobby in any of the scenes until the very end when he, when he is revealed to be the, the transvestite. Right. And um, so. He so we ended up uh, Brian ended up getting an actress named Susanna Clem to play that character, and she also played in the movie a, a policewoman. Um, so you can actually see what she looked like in the in the police scenes. But when she's in drag as Bobby, they have they did add an appliance nose to her, and the nose was based was was cast off of Michael Caine's actual nose. So she kind of had Michael Caine's nose <laughs> and the big glasses, yeah. the big dark glasses, but but everything else was her. So it was, it was you know, a bit of a cheat, but um, a necessary one to make sure that that, that reveal was going to, you know, be startling. 